Good evening. I'm Patrick Mann. It's a pleasure to greet you. I'm here in London, Ontario in my studio. And we're here uh, as a group who are representing the forthcoming exhibition, Gardenship and State, which will be taking place at Museum London in September, 2021. And it's an honor for me to be here with my colleagues and to be sharing our work with the Words Festival. And I also indeed want to acknowledge Jeff Thomas, my co-curator on this project. And we're here as only part of our group. Now, before we get going, I wanna do a land acknowledgement. So I acknowledge that my studio is on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Lonak Paywak, and the Adirondack peoples on lands connected with the London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon, Spoon Covenant Wampum. And the people that you see on your screen are uh, my collaborators on this project, as mentioned, Jeff Thomas, we have Michelle Wilson, Ron Benner, Laurie Blondeau, Mark Kasumovic, Quinn Smallboy, and writer-historian Joan Greer. And they, some of them are here in London in their respective studios and workspaces, and some of them are in other parts of Canada or beyond, and, and you'll hear about that as we go along. Among the people working on this project, there are several other artists and I just want to acknowledge them. Sean Caulfield, Paul Chartrand, Tom Culp, Michael Farnan, Jamili Hassan, Charmise Lakar, Jessica Karohanga, Mary Mattingly, Ashney, Ashley Snook, and Adrian Stimson, and also the writers Amelia Fay and Andres Vila. So our program this afternoon will involve each of us speaking about our work, and the, the program was built from the artist studio. And you will find that artists really define their studios very, very differently from one another. And that is part of the way that we, we think about our practice is, is we also have to articulate and define what we think of as the studio space. So you'll be hearing from each of, of the presenters and then we'll have some shared discussion and we will um, certainly be open and interested in your questions. So I wanna say just a couple of things about the project and then I will very quickly talk a little bit about my own work because not only am I a co-curator along with Jeff, but I'm also going to be exhibiting in the, in the uh, exhibition. So the exhibition, as said, features the work of 17 artists and also involves three uh, writers, scholars. It's entitled Gardenship and State, and it will be taking place at Museum London in September 2021 to December of that same year. Our focus is on environmental critique, decolonization, and I think uh, that if you have not only access to um, the presentations today, but you see the exhibition, you'll see that we're taking on these problematics in an aesthetically rich and hopefully challenging way. I wanna add to that and say that the project was conceived at the intersection of environmental approaches, decolonial ideas and artistic practice. And we're trying to examine what we think of as urgent issues confronting us today. Many of them won't be a surprise to you climate change and global warming, and the measures that state and non-state actors can or should take to resolve these wicked problems. The challenges we know are of global concern, and yet we think that local actions and global effects are certainly intertwined. And therefore our project is very much situated or begins out of this context and the artists have met here in London, Ontario previously, but it's outward looking insofar as it connects with communities across Canada and internationally, and will also be a platform for further community projects that will follow from the exhibition in 2021. Now, before I add a little bit about my own work, I also want to say that there's a couple of other attendant programs that, that accompany what you're participating in here today. One of them is that we're having a slideshow that is being projected through the giant windows at the center at the Forks uh, at Museum London here in London, Ontario. And the slideshow uh, began last night and, and ran all night. It will go again tonight and tomorrow night. 
and it features images, actually two images by each of the 17 visual presenters. And certainly um, overlooking the Thames River or the Dishkan Zibi, um, it really makes, uh, I think, a statement that speaks to the context that we are beginning with. Um, and I want to thank Josh Lambier of Words Festival, Museum London, and all the artists and other contributors for putting that, ex that slideshow together. The other thing I want to mention is that we have a, another program that's coming from this one. It's called Around the Kitchen Table. And on the one hand, I think you will find that some of the presenters here today are acknowledging the kitchen table as an important context for making. But the, the gathering that we're going to be having will be an opportunity for people to sign up and actually come around the kitchen table via Zoom and work alongside artist Michelle Wilson, who's here today, Ashley Snook, and Charmise the Car, and we're hoping that others will want to join. So please have a look at the, the WORDS website to get more information on that. Okay, so to my work. Um, I think, first of all, I will add again my thought that I think it's important to recognize that studios exist in very, very different ways. Mine actually probably fulfills the idea of an artist studio, although it looks pretty clean. These are some of my works, which I will mention. And I have this little turntable in order to kind of show you my space. You'll see that it's messy in some places and less so in others, but it's a big space. And in London, Ontario, you can rent pretty big spaces quite cheaply, but I would still acknowledge that my studio space represents a certain level of privilege. I have a teaching job at the university, and so I'm able to rent this space and work alongside other colleagues. But I think artists do need to make a lot of choices when it comes to their studios. And so you'll be hearing more about the kinds of choices they make in terms of making spaces in our, in our program. Um, behind me are what I think of as studies. And they're studies that relate to the larger theme that I'm working on for the exhibition. And that is, I'm thinking of flags as signifiers of the question of the state. And so I think of these as sort of studies for flags that actually do incorporate collage. They incorporate collages that are based on some 19th century graphic arts manuals that actually really kind of represented the landscape unpopulated, no presence of Indigenous people, for example. And so I'm trying to, in a sense, harvest those images in order to rethink what a flag that is decolonial might look like. But also, I think that we have this really urgent kind of question. And for me, I articulated in this way, is what would a flag look like that recognizes and respects land rights of peoples, including and especially indigenous peoples, while also representing the necessity that we think beyond borders regarding the environment and sustainability. And part of our project, I think, really does take up the idea, the problematic, that the environment, as said, is a wicked international or, or it's a problem that goes well beyond borders for all of us. So that's my preoccupation. But as an artist, I often work my way into my project through doing and making. So I've begun with these flag-like works that are made of wood and collage and paint. And ultimately, I think the works that are going to make their way into the exhibition will be related to these, but they won't be these works specifically. So I'm gonna leave it at that in part. Oh, actually, I want to say one more thing about this, this question of statehood and or, or the problem of statehood and, uh, and borders and the environment. And just on the, the front page of the Globe and Mail today, there was a reference to the indigenous land back movement. And for me, that's a really important uh, exemplar of the fact that this question of state uh, obviously goes to land rights and obviously does intersect with the problems around the environment as well. So I will leave it at that. And we're going to move on with presentations by other artists, presenters. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff Thomas. Thanks, Patrick. 
and uh, greetings to everybody that can, that's here this evening. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, take part in this project with uh, Patrick and to work as a uh, co-curator. The experience has been um, really great in terms of, um, especially with our studio visits and listening to the artists talk to uh, raise ideas and to kind of build on the things that, um, that we're talking about and thinking about. I would have to say that uh, in terms of my work, I, I identify myself now as a photo-based uh, storyteller. Uh, for many years, I went by the title of, um, of uh, Urban Iroquois because my issues revolved around the urbanization of um, in our communities and the lack of representation and uh, confronting the issues that, uh, such as systemic racism that we deal with in an urban environment. For about uh, four years, I lived in Winnipeg. I had uh, run away from Toronto and I was uh, looking for new inspiration. And interestingly enough, over a period of time, I was uh, influenced by the, uh, the forks, the uh, confluence of the Red and the Assiniboine Rivers. It wasn't long after that that I moved back to Ontario, but I felt that I was coming back with, um, with a purpose, a new purpose in terms of um, how do we coexist uh, with one another, especially in the, in the arts. And that really set in motion the type of work that I've been doing over the years in terms of uh, collaboration. I find that it's far more interesting to, to work in this sense uh, than to be isolated um, in a studio. And uh, it seems that the time is right in terms of how do we look at, so a lot of people use the word reconciliation to talk about the topics and the themes and, that are going on now and how people are addressing that. But I also think that um, I see it in the arts as well in terms of how do we begin to speak to one another as artists from different cultural and ethnic backgrounds, which is uh, fascinating for me. And I would have to say that the idea of collaboration uh, really began uh, when I was a young boy visiting uh, my elders at the Six Nations Reserve. And the, uh, the type of work that I began to produce over the last 10 years was, uh, is based on the uh, Hiawatha Wampum Belt. And I was interested in, in the idea of, um, of forming a confederacy in contemporary times. And how do we begin to talk about that as once again, as allies of working for one purpose, which is to, I guess, and in, in not in the simplest way to, to build a better society for, for our children. And how do we go about doing that? And the first thing is about talking and uh, expressing our ideas and sharing them. And how do we find that common base? And that's really what, um, what I'm interested in, my career began in an artist run center in Buffalo, New York, where I was born and raised. And the idea, what I learned from working at an artist run center uh, has really been a part of my work as well. Not, it's been a kind of a confluence of what I learned from my elders and what I learned uh, from the artist run center and thinking about community and how do we begin to engage people who may not uh, have any idea about the arts or really care about it. But how do we get those people engaged in, in this in this atmosphere of that we're talking about today? Uh, the panel that I'm showing here is one that uh, will be in the exhibition. Um, I'm going to be uh, working on a collaboration with uh, Ron Benner uh, with his garden, but also I'm using the metaphor of corn as a way of uh, how it was explained to me in terms of when our peacemaker was uh, putting his vision into action and talking about corn as the future of the children. And it's been a very important metaphor for me in terms of the photograph on the far left is my elder, Miss Emily General, who was a teacher at Six Nations. She um, organized the first indigenous theater company in, in the 1940s. And that was the place where I sat around the kitchen table and listened to my elders tell stories. And that had a great impact on my work in terms of looking at more or less of a storyboard that's based on the wampum belt. And what is the story that I want to tell? And the chair is represents really the, the, the type of chair that I would have sat in in the house. And it became a symbol for me in terms of 
how do we begin to fill that chair as storytellers, as adults? And the next image shows the corn drying on an old swing set at my grandmother and step-grandfather's um, home at Six Nations. And it was during that time that um, my step-grandfather, Bert General, was showing us how to braid uh, white corn for drying. And I remember that um, uh, there was the obvious kind of connection with the symbols of, uh, of the corn and drying and history and that. And I was watching him weave the corn together just as you would make braid your hair. And I came to understand that that was really the teaching that I was, that I was being given in terms of how do we begin to unite into one, one braid. And fundamentally, that's what I see taking place uh, with this project, with Gardenship and State. And then finally, the photograph on the far right-hand side is the photograph of Emily's father, Chief Jacob General, that was made uh, in 1912 by a visiting physical anthropologist at Six Nations who was studying the characteristics uh, and influence of intermarriage on the Iroquois people. So the panel represents my version of it with two open ends that represent what we're doing tonight in terms of that form of communication and telling our stories. And I think that this is the fundamental part of my work is that how do we, what are the stories that we wanna tell and what is the impact that they will have? Not only on the people that are listening, but when we think about education. And I think this is the important point when we talk about reconciliation is that I see it in the school system that at some point our histories have to be taught and understood in order for the general public to understand why we have protest, why there is systemic racism. And at some point, hopefully we'll build a better society. But this is kind of like planting the seeds in the ground now uh, with this community, community of artists and we're um, having a good time. And I think that that's what it should be about. And that um, that is the underpinning for, for this project for me. Now we're talking about another confluence where the rivers meet and um, I'll pass it on from here. Thanks, Jeff. Actually, I should acknowledge Jeff is, is uh, in Ottawa where he's speaking to us. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle Wilson. Thanks, Patrick. Um, I'm at home in my home office slash studio that I share with my partner. Um, I guess I'll just turn my camera a little bit so you can see it. This is the work I'm gonna be speaking out be about behind me here. Um, and this is seven by research that I need to visualize as I go. So I'm gonna start by just talking about my work generally. I had the privilege of being an artist in residence at Riding Mountain National Park in Manitoba back in 2016, um, just before I came to London to start my PhD. And I spent two weeks following and listening to bison, their ecosystems and the people who care for them. And this experience has shaped my life ever since. Um, at that time, I was already questioning our relationships to the more than human and what the connected practices of taxidermy and conservation say about those relationships. But my attention to bison has challenged me to understand so much more. Um, I've had to come to know indigenous knowledge systems and values and environmental history and colonial politics and frontier mythology and climate change and the Dust Bowl and the list is ever widening. And bison have become a way to interrogate the past and to imagine a different future. I'm just gonna share um, a couple of images of this work. Sorry. I haven't got a smooth flow yet. There, that should come up. Uh, it gives you a sense of the scale. It's spread out on a, a double-sized bed here. Um, for the Garden Ship and State exhibition, I'm creating one of my most ambitious, ambitious work, works about bison in a whole um, constellation of works. It's a textile map that shows the historical range of the bison that you can see described here with the contour line. 
Um, and eventually it'll be cut down and stretched over a hoop that I'm designing and custom making for this piece. I imagine it having echoes with a, a drum, but also the taxidermy mounting shield that you see when you see heads stuck to walls. Um, it'll be free hanging and this is a little not great concept drawing, but it gives you the idea and weighted to the ground with rocks so that the viewer can both interact with the um, front and view the back. So the red that you're seeing is um, needle felted wool into a um, wool felt industrial size piece. Um, they reference satellite imagery of current bodies of water and they become sculptural by uh, hand embroidering stitches that reference um, tides and currents. Um, once the piece is mounted, I'll be using beadwork and uh, conductive thread to trace a final forced migration of bison that resulted in their current population in uh, Canadian park system. So it started with calves being um, collected after a hunt in Saskatchewan, if you can see my cursor, and then brought to Winnipeg to an estate there. They were then sold uh, to the warden at Stony Mountain Penitentiary, also near Winnipeg. And then from there sold south to um, Garden City, Kansas, where they were joined with calves that were collected in an even more brutal way um, from the Southern her herd there. They were then sold uh, to individuals on the Flathead Reservation in Montana, and then bought by the Canadian government and shipped to Buffalo National Park uh, near Wainwright, some of them via Elk Island National Park, uh, and that was an ecological disaster. So the bison were then sent to Wood Buffalo National Park, uh, which currently still has many, many problems. So that's the story that I'm trying to um, encapsulate in this work and each, um, whoops, sorry. I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen. So each kind of grouping of threads will act as a sensor to trigger an audio piece that tells um, something about that leg of the journey and each one of them really is interpreted in different ways. Um, these stories are works of historical fiction based on research, um, but also first person reflective pieces. And I hope they are always critical of the often white supremacist and sometimes even criminal sources that they're drawn from. Um, and they, they center the bison's relationships of kinship. Um, so this is kind of a little sample of what that beadwork and embroidery is going to look like. So, um, for example, from Battleford to Winnipeg, there are only three bison, so three strands to represent them. But by the time we're going from um, Garden City to the Flathead Reservation, there are 49. And then from Buffalo National Park um, to Elk Island to, sorry, from from uh, the Flathead Reservation to Buffalo National Park, there'll be 748. So you can imagine how complex these webs will be um, by the end. Yeah, so thank you for listening. Thanks, Michelle. I'm gonna turn it over to Ron Benner, who's in his um, studio home at 514 Pall Mall in London, Ontario. Thanks, Patrick. Um... Briat Savarin, the French uh, writer, he, he, he said a uh, hundred years ago, he said, tell me what you eat and I'll tell you who you are. Now, the funny thing about that is, is that for instance, uh, I live uh, on the ancestral uh, territory of the Atawandaran, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the, the Wendat, the uh, Lenin Ala and the Manape, originally from uh, uh, Long Island, Delaware area, but uh, they all talked about the three sisters, and uh, so this is what I eat. I'm going to start showing the stuff that's in my kitchen and in my studio oftentimes. So we got some black beans. They're my favorite bean. They're one of the three sisters of uh, native uh, cuisine. We got the butternut squash, made in Canada, Canadian one of the three sisters. And then you've got the ubiquitous 
maize, corn. This one's from Mexico, but uh, those were the three sisters of the people that still live here. And I eat all that stuff, but uh, I'm not First Nation, but uh, sometimes I feel like it. So we got the three sisters. And then what's happened for me is, is that there's lots more crops that uh, First Nations farmers still grow. This is one of the most famous. This is, uh, can you see that? That's uh, wild rice. That's, uh, that, that's, that wild rice is from Curved Lake. They're replanting it all the time there now. It's very good. I love it. So I'm gonna keep going. All this stuff is uh, in my kitchen. Oh, I didn't show you this corn. This corn is uh, purple Peruvian corn. Now, the corn has, is 8,000 years old in the Americas. It's, a, it's the same age as, uh, almost the same age as barley in Iraq. Entering from my kitchen, the potato, First Nation crop, first grown by the uh, ancestors of the Quechua, the Aymara people from Peru. They have 2,000 different kinds of potatoes in Peru. We have in Canada, usually in the supermarkets or stores, there are maybe six different varieties. Come on the other way, sweet potato. Again, native to the Americas, grown for thousands of years. It's grown all over the world now, but it's, uh, I eat it, I love it, but it's a uh, First Nation crop. Come on the other way, tomatoes. I had a friend, this is like about 35, 40 years ago. She was a, a Italian ancestry. I told her that tomatoes originally came from Mexico and Peru. And uh, she, she said, that's not true. The Italians have always had the tomato. Yeah, not true. Chili peppers. Where did they come from? Now in Mexico, they're considered one of the three sisters. Corn, beans, and chili peppers, not squash. But uh, chili peppers are were found uh, throughout the Americas, all different kinds of varieties. Now they're everywhere in the world, but uh, they were a First Nation crop growing for thousands of years. These are all from my kitchen and studio. Um, Hell, you know, when I wake up in the morning sometimes and I have a shave or I shave at night, I use witch hazel, native to the Americas, used by the First Nations. I use it. I don't know what Briat Savarin is going to think of me, but all spice, <laughs> all spice, native to Mexico, I use it. Vanilla, native to Mexico and Guatemala. Chipotle peppers, Mexican. Ah, Italian tomato paste, Italian, no, Mexican, but made in Canada, I think. Yeah. One of my favorites, Quitlacoche, the corn uh, mushroom, there it is. I don't like the company, but I eat it. Oh, pineapple. This one's from Costa Rica. Native to the Americas, grown by the First Nation farmers for 5,000 years, you know, crazy. Fries, cocoa, zucchini, <laughs> avocado, Mexican, baker's chocolate, <laughs> mole poblano. Mexican chocolate, Czech turkey, turkeys, native of the Americas. Okay, that's enough for now. I got tons, but uh, you know, I can go on forever. Thanks, Ron. I'm worried we're gonna lose some of our audience because everybody's gonna go start making dinner, but that was amazing. Um, now I'm gonna introduce Lori Blondeau, who is, I can tell you she's in Winnipeg. I just told you for her. Hi, Lori. Hi, um, I'm currently uh, living in Treaty One territory, Winnipeg. 
I'm from Treaty Tor Four territory. Um, I'm my father is Métis, my mother's Korean Soto. I work, well, I used to work a lot in performance art, but you know, with everything going on in the world, um, trying to reinvent how we do performance art. I guess a lot like Jeff, I consider myself a storyteller, a visual storyteller. I do it through performance, photography, installation. I um, work a lot with rocks and I have throughout my career. And this image that you see is uh, from a series I did in, started in 2016 and by 2017, I think I had it finished. And it's a, a series of uh, four photographs. Um, I had been looking at a rock in Saskatchewan that had been uh, blown up in 1966 called Mistassini. It was one of our ceremonial rocks. Sorry that my phone keeps going off. <laughs> and um, so in the, in the 60s and 65, the government, along with the government of Saskatchewan, wanted to dam the South Saskatchewan River. Um, and at the time, it's where the South Saskatchewan River meets the Assiniboine River. And it was a huge gathering spot for our people. And there was this ceremonial rock that was there. And uh, the government decided that they're gonna blow up the rock. The rock was quite huge. This is just a part of that rock that they saved and put in memorial at, at uh, Elbow, Saskatchewan. And there was protests that went on. Uh, Wilford Tatusis, the late Wilford Tatusis protest, Buffy St. Marie to try to save the rock. And then they just ended up blowing it up in the middle of the night because of these protests. And I always think of the rocks as, you know, like there are history holders, our history tellers for us as Plains, Indigenous people, all of our rock art and our ceremonial um, medicine wheels, like that tells our history. And I think through the clearing of the plains, they, you know, the settlers really wanted to pretend like we weren't there. So let's get rid of all of this stuff that told our history of who we were as people. And there's still lots of sites that exist and there's still lots of sites that are still being um, found and by people that go out looking for them and then they register them with the um, archeology span Society of Saskatchewan that then fights to make them historical sites so that mining companies can't just go and, you know, clear these medicine wheels or these rock formations that my ancestors had um, made. Uh, I was thinking about the one question that uh, you had posed, Patrick, about, or I don't know if it was you, but it was something about um, acknowledgement of other beings well as plains people you know like we like the buffalo was our life it was all of our life like it was clothing it was lodging it was food everything <clears throat> and I sort of see you know these rock art I like to call it rock art it's been called rock art and then some of it's ceremonial like the the medicine wheels um as they were just as important as uh, the buffalo were to the plains people. And it, so you can see how big this rock, this piece of the rock, Mistassini, it, it was big. It was like 17 feet high. And then I can't remember what the, how wide, wide it was. 
it was big and this was just the piece and how they uh, memorialized it on each side of this piece of the Mistassini rock. They did two Karens, one's in Cree talking about what the rock meant to us as Cree people and then in English talking about the rock. Um, and then a few years ago, uh, I don't know, I want to say maybe 2014, um, Wilfred Tatusa's son, Tyrone Tatusa, he's, he's also passed away. He was like a cultural um, Cree man in Saskatchewan. And he went to, because now where the rock used to be, they, um, it's under Lake Beef, Diefenbaker, which is a man-made lake because that's where they flooded. And um, he went with a diving team to go see if they could find some remnants of the rock under the water. And they did, they were able to find it. But I would imagine also too, when, when they flooded that land, because it was a huge gathering spot for the Cinnaboy, the Soto, the Cree, and just all the teepee rings that probably also got you know, washed away or covered up with all of the water. So um, I just think of the rocks, we call them our grandfathers, they are our storytellers. I think of my late, so that's Lake Diefenbaker behind me, um, the, the land that they had flooded. And I think of my late uh, mentor, James Luna, who um, who said that he goes, Lori, like we're high tech storytellers. And it was, that term came from, um, he was at a film festival in San Francisco and this elder, after he had done his presentation and his talk, she came up to him and said, you're a high tech storyteller, that's what you are. Um, so I always uh, like to acknowledge him if I use the term high tech storytellers because that's what I feel we are as visual artists, as Indigenous people making visual art and working within um, the art world. And we're still here. And so are those rocks. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Lori. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Mark Kasumovic. And Mark, you can tell us where you are. Uh, hello, everyone. So yeah, I'm in the UK right now. So it's a little bit later than it is for most of you. Um, and I apologize if I'm not speaking as eloqu eloquently as I usually do. I just had my first, my second child yesterday. <laughs> and it was a, a hectic day. So I haven't had much sleep. So I do apologize. But I don't know um, where to start. And I just wanted to say that I'm really happy to be a part of this project. And I, I think Perhaps I'm coming at it from a slightly different perspective than a lot of people, but I, as a practitioner, I've always seen myself as not having a studio at all and much more thinking about the world as a studio for me and the way in which I can take little pieces of the world outside and kind of hopefully make sense of it somehow and not necessarily uh, make sense, but also ask questions and, and raise questions that are hopefully important to people. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen because I think the best way is to talk about some of the work um, that I've completed. And I am so sorry. So it's asking me to quit in order to share my screen. So if everyone can bear with me, it'll probably just take five seconds. I'm so sorry. While we're waiting for Mark, I will invite you, if you have questions that you would like us to take up or individual artists to, to respond to, certainly feel free to, um, to write them into the chat and we'll, uh, we'll have some time in a few minutes to do that. So hopefully we didn't lose Mark in England somewhere. I'm sorry, am I back? Yes. Okay, I'm, I'm, I really do apologize to everybody. Um, but can everyone see my screen now? Yeah. Okay, so, um, and many apologies again. So for me, uh, a big part of my past was always trying to analyze places and uh, places where I go 
um, and try to understand what they're essentially for within humanity, really. So, and for my last big project, I did look at um, scientific kind of areas of investigation. So anywhere that was kind of asking large questions about the world and trying to do that scientifically. And for me, I thought that's such an interesting thing because all these scientists are using something very related to um, the camera. And that's exactly what I use. And scientists are using cameras to try to understand the world around them. They're using it to identify phenomenon. Um, and pretty much every kind of science really out there uses cameras in a similar, not exactly the same, of course, but in a similar way. And they try to, they try to uh, understand data. And for me, it, it just became this kind of enlightening thing, um, essentially where you know, I, I could go out into the world and try to gather data and it didn't have to be as scientific, but it could, it could try to answer some questions that are difficult to answer. And some of the places I visited were really spectacular. There's some of the places where we start to see some, you know, some of the biggest questions being asked, like, for example, at CERN in Geneva, they're asking, you know, how does the universe, how did the universe come to exist? And that's such an amazing and, and large question that I found fascinating. But other places that were really fascinating were places like um, the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. And I, I just thought it, it's just such, a, such an interesting concept for us to need to have to essentially store these seeds just in case something horrible happens um, and, and essentially uh, to have a place we can store seeds and be able to replant if we do lose something major in our lives. And for me, I, I started to combine uh, images with texts and I started to really think about how, how images aren't really representations of reality all the time and how text can sometimes distort um, reality as well. And, and, and really investigating how scientific fact can, and, um, can start playing with images. And that's all I did. I really started to combine images with scientific facts, but also the combination became very poetic. Um, and hopefully you can read the text, but I think just that, that strange combination of, of images and scientific texts became this kind of way I could start to explore these places in, in a slightly different way. And that, that's just something I, I really like to, to play around with. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that. Um, So thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Fascinating images. Uh, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Quinn Smallboy, uh, who I will share my screen in order to show you some of Quinn's work. Do you want me to do that now, Quinn? Okay. Oh, you gotta turn on your mic. Yep, sounds good. Oops, sorry, I gotta do this properly. Ah, I did. So you can tell me when you want me to show the other slide, Quinn. Uh, okay. Uh, no, that's good for now. Um, yes, uh, welcome. Um, thanks for having me on in this meeting. Um, this project is pretty exciting that we're all part of and I'm glad to be part of it. Um, I'm actually coming, I, I kind of, my studio space right now, what, what kind of everybody's talking about, but I kind of like the idea, like I have uh, made my shed into a, like my studio space, more or less for like cutting and cutting, cutting the wood and um, other things. But I think the majority of my work when I sometimes when I work with the string is I actually do it like right here in my living room. <laughs> I'm sitting on my couch and I would say I work from like the smaller strings. I have yet to try to get into much larger strings. <laughs> I don't know if I'm gonna ever make something about using this diameter of string. It's pretty large. It might be really expensive as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, I generally like sit on my couch and uh, do my weaving of the drum rings. Um, and other things I kind of play with, been playing with lately too, is um, 
the ideas of, of the uh, string games. Um, I'm doing one on my hand right now. You just can't see this. So if you guys remember, Jeff or Lori, do you guys remember doing the string games and creating stuff like this? Um, I kind of incorporate that into uh, the drum works I do. Um, aside from the, the image that you're looking at right now, this was um, my first public sculpture I did up in Manitoulin Island. I'm just gonna bring out my phone and tell you what um, the write-up I have for it. Um, yeah, the color choices is what sets it apart from something new in relation to a more recognizable color uh, color scheme of your red, white, and yellow, uh, black of the medicine wheel. Uh, the name of the work I'm calling is Drum Circle, bringing this idea of coming together in a shared welcoming environment of the powwow gathering. Each color I feel holds a connection to the curatorial theme um, of what they were asking for. Uh, the green and blue, this is something that's quite different than what I believe is fairly new, what I like about it. Uh, green and blue represent the relations between the land environment land and environmental change and reconciliation white representing and knowledge the important role of the three uh curatorial communities within and adjacent to the township uh the french the english and the first nations ojibwe ottawa and the potawatomi and black represents learning from the past and imagining the shared future i'm, I'm sorry i have to reiterate what i just said because it's um that was their curatorial theme they were looking for up in manitoulin island so I kind of took it to a different step with the green and blue, which um, is quite um, different in this change and quite unique. In terms of like what the project um, um, that I'm working on for the garden ship uh, state is I'm taking the same, some somewhat similar idea, but more or less making a larger drum string, uh, drum, <laughs> drum ring and the idea is to, again, not to make it uh, reminiscent of the, um, the dream catcher, but more or less uh, weaving in um, effects, uh, different patterns, like what is happening right now and like, um, and today, in today's society, more or less. Uh, if you could show the other image. Yeah, and here's uh, the other, um, this one I call hands. I had this at my uh, thesis show at um, Macintosh Gallery. Hands, uh, the idea of the hands coming together, uh, represented by the string. And, and again, just this idea of just telling these stories within the drum circle. And I just, I think like having the, the drum circle and having what it represents is, um, yeah, like like the ideas of coming together in um, in the shared space as, as a powwow. Um, I had a different image in mind <laughs> that we were going to show, but that's that's all right. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just uh, the idea of using new um, new rope, uh, different kinds. Or uh, the, another thing I like to add is for the project is I might be incorporating um, color might be coming into the, the work as you can see there's black like for the first image but that's a public sculpture where I had the green and blue but I might be using different colored string which might be I guess out of my comfort zone more or less because I've always used the black string in, in my work um, yeah I think uh, I think I'll leave it at that all right thank you thanks Quinn <clears throat> Great. Um, so now we're, we're going to wrap up the, the brief talks with uh, hearing from Joan Greer. And I'll turn it over to you, Joan. And um, you can let me know. Do you want me to uh, share my screen with your slide now? Sure. Why don't you do that, please, Patrick? Thank you very much. So um, uh, I'm really happy to be here today and to uh, 
be with all of you that I can't see, but also to, to see some of uh, the people who I have seen, but not for a whole year, and to to hear uh, hear you and some of, and to see some of your uh, work that you're you're thinking about now. So thank you all. Um, I'm speaking to you today from Edmonton, uh, from Treaty 6 territory, uh, more specifically from the North Saskatchewan River Valley, uh, territory that is a traditional gathering place for a diversity of Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, and many others. And today, um, I'm going to be talking about my part in Gardenship and State. Uh, the writing I'm doing for Gardenship and State is really at a very preliminary stage. It's a work in progress, and it's one that will be very collaborative in nature. So I'm taking close notes and listening carefully and looking, and, and really uh, it's wonderful to hear what people are thinking and see what they're, what they're doing. Um, I'm working in a way that's relational then, whenever possible. But there are some conceptual ideas that inform my part of the project that I'd like to talk about today. The tentative title for my essay that I'll be writing is Where the Antlers Branch, Artistic Navigations and Cross-Pollinations for Catastrophic Times. So the writing I'm undertaking that I'm describing today will be in two main parts. I respond to the theme of gardenship and state by first locating the project firmly on the river, sometimes known as the Thames, that is the waterway on which this project is situated, and undertaking a decolonized acknowledgement of place, focusing on the river itself, its rich non-colonial importance and names, including but not only Dashkan Zibi, its history, past, present, but also future, its source, its path, it's human, but also importantly, it's non-human human inhabitants. The idea of origins in relation to a specific place comes up, but also of journeys and of migration. These all relate to the river and the notion of place. I also respond to the theme by considering my own background as an art historian and drawing from notions tied to gardenship and state, considering, for example, early woodcut representations of ship of state or the ship of fools and other thematically related artistic representations from past art. But more especially, I'm turning to earlier representations such as the one you see uh, on the screen, which is by Theo van Hoytema, it's a uh, early 20th century print, Dutch print, um, th that deal with views of gardens and forest undergrowth, often very close up uh, views, including looking at the multi-species inhabitants with special attentiveness um, that I, I really bring to this, looking at pollinators uh, and the habitats of pollinators. Third and related to this focus of pollinators is the idea of non-human protagonists in a more general sense. And I bring that right down to the idea and uh, the um, aspect of insects. So insects and looking at insects will enliven the garden metaphor and lead to a discussion of a central theme of the artist pollinator. And related to that, the idea of ecological envisioning through art, earth narratives, and what botanist and member of the citizen Potawatomi nation, Robin Wall Kimmerer has referred to as a grammar of animacy. When she takes her students out into, uh, to do field work in the woods, um, Robin Wall Kimmerer talks about the woods and talks about uh, what it is to know the world as a neighborhood of non-human residents. So in addition to, to these ideas and looking at pollinators, I'll also be looking to insect decomposers and the making of rich compost and the analogy of a generative artist decomposer. 
the second part of, of, of my writings will relate to the works of the others in the exhibition, some of the things you've just been hearing about. So examining individually and then weaving together some of the creative impulses found within these works. I'll be engaging with the works, hopefully very relationally and seeing how they engage with each other relationally. Perhaps finding the generative futuring outcomes within the exhibition, including ones that may be relational intangibles. Um, so this part of my contribution to the project is the most speculative at this point and by far the most intriguing. Um, it's challenging and wonderful from my point of view and it's a real privilege to be able to do this. My question then for everyone, um, because uh, we're asking some questions of each other, my question relates to some of these multi-species ideas. And I ask, in how far does, you, does your work engage either literally or metaphorically with biodiversity and a multi-species way of looking at the world, one in which the human is decentered, and perhaps even specifically with that of pollinators or decomposers? So those are just some, some thoughts I'll leave you with. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Joan. So um, I know we have a few questions, but maybe we could start with Joan's question about the multi-species uh, influences that she's interested in. And um, I don't wanna call people out necessarily, but uh, I know probably Michelle might have something to say, Laurie might have something to say, perhaps others. Michelle, do you wanna go first? Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that there are works that I'm developing right now that really literally engage with multi-species participants. Um, one where moths have been seeded into uh, a wool piece that is trying to embody the destructive and unpredictable um, impacts of climate change. Uh, another one where I'm harvesting clay uh, to create vessels. Um, for to, to grow plants to use in phytoremediation and put back in the earth where the clay Can came from. Yeah. Sorry, I have, a, I have an audience here. Um, so, but I also think about the multi-species, the multi-species way that uh, bison embody those kinds of communities. Um, they are engineers of biodiversity. They carry seeds that they uh, co-evolved with the human communities that um, have evolved around them and just prairie dogs and, and wolves and so many communities that co-evolved with these beings. Um, so those are the kind of stories and the way that bison change the land and the waterways that they interact with. Um, so these are all stories that I'm trying to weave into the work and I think are embodied in the bison themselves. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Michelle. Um, Lori, anything further you wanted to add? And because you kind of started in um, when you were talking, giving your talk, anything further on this? Um, the work I showed isn't the work that's for this project. Uh, I'm, I'm, I think because we're living in this time, <laughs> had a lot of time to think. And um, I think this whole idea of um, the thematic of the curatorial for this project was really interesting. And then, you know, we were hit by this pandemic, which I think makes this project even more important now than it did before. And I guess the other thing I just wanted to say, you know, um, with colonialism and when you're going to colonize a people, and I think that's what really happened here on the plains, was you take away their food source, you know, and that's what happened. And I think it's really great that we do have some pure bison herds, uh, two of them being in Saskatchewan, one at uh, Prince Albert National Park and the other one at uh, grasslands in southern Saskatchewan. P Prince Albert is more in the north. Um, and to see like what Michelle was talking about, like how they work with the ecology and how they work with other species and just what they do to the land, especially in Grasslands National Park, I think it really changed um, because, you know, that's some of our last 
wild prairie grass that's in that park. And I'm sure I really feel on my reserve, which is George Gordon First Nation, um, that we still have some wild prairie grass left there that hasn't been, um, you know, cleared or plowed or, you know, and I know of a couple of my friends who come from settler families and their families have really tried to preserve some of the wild prairie prairie grasses where they haven't allowed any plowing on certain fields, which I, you know, I think when it comes to allyship, I think that's, I think that's, you know, it's something that's been happening for a very long time. Um, yeah, so that's all I have to say. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Jeff, maybe if you want to jump in with your question, because I think it relates quite a lot to, to this kind of theme. Yeah, I, the question that I, that I was thinking about was um, because of the work that I'm going to be producing is based on the, um, the environmental movement that began in the 60s and 70s with uh, Poster that was well known of the uh, actor Iron Eyes Cody, <clears throat> who was an indigenous, but who became the symbol of um, the environmental movement back then. And um, I, was, I was a young kid in high school when the first time that I saw it. And I think that at that point, it really raised um, questions in my mind. Maybe not even questions, just a thoughts that, um, that I couldn't answer. And, but now looking back and I think about the work that I wanna produce for this project, I was able to find a poster on eBay and that's gonna be part of my work as well. And, um, but the question that I was interested in is, is when were people uh, inspired to move into this direction of, uh, of, um, of confrontation with, uh, with these existing issues that we have, whether it's with the environment or colonialism. And uh, uh, so I was a teenager at that time. So that's when it began for me. And I wanted to leave that question with uh, anybody else who wanted to answer it. Ron? <clears throat> Yeah, a great question, uh, Jeff. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, I just want to say that I don't see environmentalism um, and what we do as in, uh, and what we have done for years and years and years um, as Indigenous people, um, our, our livelihoods, our way of life. There's no separation from environmentalism. Ron? Yeah. Um, when, I, when I became an artist in 1971, I was uh, working on the railroad. I was a brakeman and conductor. And I worked uh, out of St. Thomas, Ontario. And my first trip into uh, uh, on, uh, a freight train was into uh, taking a, the train from St. Thomas, Ontario to Buffalo, New York. And we yarded the train in what was called the Bison Yard. And uh, myself and the rest of the crew, we stayed at the, what was called the Erie Lackawanna YMCA. And we had passed through uh, where Jeff was. Uh, were you born in Tonawanda, Jeff? No, oh, I'm mute. I was born in Buffalo. Yeah, in Buffalo. Okay, well, we went through Tonawanda, which was just on the outs, right across from Black Rock, uh, uh, the bridge. You go across the bridge over the Niagara River and mm. through Tonawanda. Anyways, we, when uh, we uh, unyarded uh, the train uh, and uh, took the diesels over to uh, where we got fuel for them and then parked them for the, uh, the rest of the night, uh, the first thing I noticed uh, about that whole area was that there was a stream that used to come through there. And the banks of the stream were uh, pitch black from uh, maybe over 100 years of coal dust. And the stream itself was a multicolored rainbow uh, uh, sheen. And, uh, and the atmosphere was um, pure diesel fuel. And so that was my introduction. Like, so I, as a railroad worker, I had traveled 
120 miles through um, different kinds of landscapes of southwestern Ontario, like Carolinian forests, uh, farmers' fields, uh, mostly with uh, corn maize or uh, um, ginseng and tobacco plants. But uh, when I got into the bison yard, it was a, a total nightmare. And uh, I lived with that for 10 years. Uh, so I was an artist, but I was also a railroad worker. And uh, it changed me totally. Like seeing that final uh, um, non-landscape, I suppose, because it was a nightmare. But it changed the way I worked as an artist because I started working with uh, uh, um, petroleum products and tar and things that were around me uh, that I didn't like, but I, I used them. And I did that for the first five, five years of my uh, career as, a, as an artist. Thank goodness I got into food. Thanks, Ron. Others have thoughts on uh, Jeff's, Jeff's query? Um, maybe I'll ask you a question. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. I was going to ask you to say a little more about your experience. Yeah, well, I, I was just going to talk a little bit about um, just my past as a photographer, again, moving into spaces and uh, for me, I, I really fell in love with landscape photography and this idea of, of how do we represent the landscape today and just getting extremely bored with this idea of romanticized landscapes or trying to make landscapes beautiful for the sake of the beauty of the image, which didn't seem to represent uh, what was really going on out there or, you know, what, what the world consists of. It's not just beautiful landscapes. There's a lot of complexity there. So for me, it really was a body of work that started to follow. Um, and if I may just share my screen very quickly again, just started to follow um, something as simple as power lines, which people generally try to not photograph uh, for the most part. Um, but in doing so, I think um, was just a lot more truthful of our a kind of landscape. Because for me, the power line started to represent you know, not only these kind of unsightly things in our landscape, but also, you know, how much uh, we rely on these structures, but also what's behind these structures, which is obviously the power generation, the coal generation, uh, or the burning of the fossil fuels in order to, to just power just about everything that we, uh, you know, do. And, and if we didn't have these structures, for example, these power lines running through our landscapes, um, how different our, our culture and society would be. So for me, really thinking about landscape for me has always been how do I show things in the landscape that are you know, more meaningful than, than the traditional kinds of landscapes that we are typically seeing. Thanks, Mark. Um, I will maybe jump in here. Somebody, um, there's a couple of questions that have come through then and I think this will map on to, to um, the conversation around Jeff's question. Um, one of them about, uh, both of them really are asking about the title Gardenship and State, how it was conceived and, and kind of what it means. Um, and uh, also, you know, the, the sort of metaphors, the combination of the garden and the ship in particular. So um, I, I came up with the title, although it, it kind of morphed um, in various ways. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of a personal stake in it. Um, you know, I was certainly always aware, you know, we've all heard Leonard Cohen singing about the mighty ship of state. And, and so that notion of, of the ship was always something that seemed kind of ubiquitous. Uh, and at the same time, as I grew, um, it, it became clear that the, the ship was obviously the bringer of colonialism historically. And when I was a teenager, um, I, uh, I'll admit to having worked on the Nonsuch, when they, when they brought the Nonsuch into the Manitoba Museum, and it was, it was a replica ship um, that, that uh, was the catch that the Hudson Bay had, had come to um, this land 
uh, via in uh, 1670. And so the Hudson Bay Company, when they had their anniversary uh, 300 years later, they rebuilt, they made a model of this, of this ship, uh, this catch. And so I, as a teenager, got a job um, working when they, on the, the ship when they refitted and brought it into the museum. And of course, you know, the politics around it, um, you know, in that would have been the early 70s, um, I was not so, um, so intimately aware of. Uh, but over the years, I, I've been really interested in how, the, how that, that emblem of so-called discovery uh, has changed so dramatically, not only for me and my experience, but uh, and my thinking, but also even I think at the Manitoba Museum, Amelia Fay, who's on our project, has been party to trying to find ways to kind of rethink the narratives around the around how this 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 emblem, this object, is understood. So so that was something that was kind of in the in the background for me. But there there was always this. You know, as as I became more and more aware of the challenges of the environment that we all share, um, some sort of a fantasy around what might have been, uh, which wasn't, and and you know seemed to be s s preoccupying me. And so this idea of the garden ship, you know, something that is is a shared kind of um, spaceship, um, was was something that I was interested in. But I think when we put together this project or when, when the project was being written up, it seemed that you couldn't have this, this kind of metaphorical imagined kind of um, uh, future or, or a, a kind of a, a past that yielded to a different kind of future. You couldn't do that without also thinking about, but what are the stakes? Like what, you know, what, what have we inherited when we think about statehood and we we think about what's been created around um, land and territory etc so i would say the garden ship is a kind of a, a sort of a fantasy but it needs to be thought about alongside the problem of the state and who's who has ownership of land and property etc and yet all of that in light of the precariousness that we all share around the environment today. So that's, <laughs> that's a generalized way of, of bringing together some of the, the thinking that, that spawned the title. Um, I never wanted the title necessarily to be colonizing the project and have always been open to the possibility that the title would shift. But um, at this point, the title has stuck and, and it seems to also have some, some possibilities that I think it didn't um, when, when the thinking around the project first began. So I hope that's uh, helpful. Jeff, any thoughts that you, you wanna add on that? Because I know that uh, you know, I sort of brought you the title at a certain point and um, so you can, um, maybe add to this? Um, I'll try. <laughs> I think that um, the, the idea of, uh, of more than, I think the title was, was just the idea of collaboration that, that, in, that intrigued me in terms of the project and how the different projects that I've looked at over the years uh, would be able to filter in with working within the heading that you had established for the, for the project. Mm -hmm. And um, it took time to, um, it took time to figure that out, but it's, uh, but it was an interesting challenge. So I think that for me, it was a challenge to find out how I would accommodate my work uh, within, uh, within, within the exhibition. And um, so it's, it's gone through a long process of trying to do that, of, of finding that element that, um, that uh, well, with the question that I posed of going back, because, you know, growing up in the city and that, uh, I remember that when I was going to, uh, when I was on the bus going to high school, that uh, I, I stole that poster from the bus. And, um, and then I'm thinking about, well, my first exhibition took place on a city bus, uh, like, five years later. So, you know, it's, it's just that um, I think within that title and thinking about the proximity of, um, of the museum to the confluence and how all of these different issues 
come into the come into play within within that wide range that that you established with with the project was was quite intriguing and leaving it open to possibilities you know i, I wouldn't imagine changing the title uh because i think that it, it, it you know it, it really it generates thought and i think when we're coming together as a group for a project like this I think, you know we're all kind of working that out and i think that's a really good challenge um to be able to do that with uh uh with with the with the image makers with the writers you know and and that and um so I think that, you know, overall is that it's, um, I don't know, I can just say that I'm really happy with the way that things are working out with this project and um, better than I actually thought that they would. Uh, not that I had any, you know, kind of misgivings about it or whatever, that it wouldn't work, but it was just, you know, you never know how things will go. And, um, but this is, this is very good in terms of um, how it's beginning to find its voice with within that heading. Yeah, thanks very much, Jeff. Um, yeah, and I would, I would, you know, working with you has certainly been a tremendous privilege. And also, I think we both recognize that while we wouldn't want to celebrate the times we're in or the need to be on Zoom all the time, we have had some amazing discussions with all the artists that had a level of um, kind of sharing that we might not have been able to experience uh, had we been sort of thinking we had to get on a plane to go and see the artists or we wouldn't be able to have the conversation. So I think it's been really exciting in that way. Um, I'm noticing the time and think we're probably getting around to the point where we need to wrap up, but I don't want to shut this down without having um, asked uh, I know, Joan, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add further or Quinn, um, you know, others, you're most welcome. I would like to just make sure we've, uh, we've heard from everybody who'd like to add anything. I can just add a, a few words. Um, I, don't, I don't need to add too much. I'm really, uh, really liking what I'm, what I'm hearing and, and, uh, and I'd just like to sort of underline that, that notion of, of community and, and trying to really um, investigate what that can be, uh, community and collaboration and uh, sort of just exploding that word and just seeing how these things can can happen. And, and that's one of the things we are doing in COVID times. It's, it's really, really difficult, but we're looking at different ways of collaborating. And certainly last year when we were all together, I think that collaborative process, not all of us were together, but many of us were together, others were, were um, just uh, coming in uh, digitally, uh, virtually. But I just think that that collaborative process and, and um, how these individual projects will relate to each other and that relational uh, notion is just, just so intriguing. So uh, just really looking forward to to seeing where everything goes. I, I, I'm, I'm really happy with everything I'm hearing and seeing too and grateful to be part of it. So yeah, those would be my final words and thoughts. Thanks. Thanks, Joan. Quinn, and Quinn has anything you want to add? We're good? I can't really think of anything right now. <laughs> I think I'm um, I think I'm good at the moment. <laughs> Hey, thank you. Um, well, I will uh, just say a couple of things and then turn it over to Jeff. I wanted to, um, when Joan mentioned community, we were maybe going to talk a little bit about that, and I think we don't have time, but I want to recognize um, the community that uh, has been around this ex this project so far, and, and to thank in particular Ron Benner and Jamili Hassan, who have been tremendously generous all so far and, and all along around um, bringing their expertise and their kind of groundedness here in London, Ontario to, to the project. So that's been a, a real, you know, it's, it's been so important. And I, I think, you know, one of the things that Jeff has been kind of encouraging is that we, we, we map out, you know, our, our kind of origins, where we come from in whatever way we want to um, interpret that. And I think that that idea of a sense of place has been really, really important to this project thus far. And certainly I think Ron and Jamili have, you know, contributed in so many ways to that. So I will, I will uh, leave it there for me and just thank everybody for a wonderful um, gathering. Jeff? Yeah, I think I'll just end by 
by uh, referencing what's going on now in terms of land issues uh, in Caledonia, Ontario, uh, along the edge of um, the Six Nations of the Grand River, and how important um, that issue represents a lot of the things that we're talking about. But I think that um, uh, I remember when when it, things uh, kind of erupted, when was it 2006, 2007, I think it was. Um, so it's an ongoing problem. But I remember what it looked like in the beginning with people on two sides, with the people from Caledonia and then the uh, people from Six Nations that were protecting the land that had never been uh, legally uh, signed over and, uh, and the continuing uh, shrinking of the land base. But I think it's really, you know, it's, it's about talking to one another. I remember when, when my step-grandfather, when he used to go into Caledonia, he would take me with him and he'd go in and to the racetrack and sit in the, uh, in the horse sheds and talk to the old timers in there. And, and they were, uh, were non-indigenous people, but you know, they were all friends. He had friends with uh, different uh, people on the outskirts of, of the reserve and that. So I saw that as a young boy and I thought that, um, that, was, that was very interesting coming from an urban environment where there isn't that real sense of sharing and talking commonality. What we're doing, I think is really important work in terms of how do we get back to a state where we're talking to one another rather than standing on two sides, two different sides of the border and, uh, and setting an example, which is I think is what the arts should be about. You know, it's not about um, your CV or how much money you make or where you've had an exhibition or, or whatever. I mean, that's all part of the function of the arts in a one way, but the most important part I think is, is how do we begin to contribute to the well-being of our society that we all share now? And uh, how do we begin to talk about these things? And as I said in the beginning, it comes back to education and learning from one another. So we're setting an example in that way. And that's very important. And in this time of COVID and having to rely on Zoom for meetings and talking to one another, it seems to enhance that, that um, intimacy of talking and how powerful it can be and just what happens when people talk to one another and how you get excited and and that's the best part about what the arts is and what it should be it's about sharing and getting excited about things and thinking that it's not the end of the world i'll leave it there thank you so much and thanks to everybody for joining us including all of you in the audience <laughs>